the next hour uh, and benefit from the cross-section of panelists we have here this morning to consider the overarching theme for this meeting of, of sparking a climate of innovation, driving innovation, fueling innovation in Europe, to really unpack that into a number of different facets of the innovation ecosystem from uh, the talent component to technology and what's being innovated to social entrepreneurship to new modes of innovation, looking at design and science, uh, looking at the research climate in Europe, uh, and really engaging with you in conversations and taking the advantage of uh, this broad uh, opportunity with this panel uh, to tackle really any possible dimension from the standpoint of people who are doing it, uh, who are representing some of the uh, leading game changers across Europe and, and those driving disruption in a number of different sectors. Uh, to, to really unpack this innovation uh, story. So I want to I wanna kind of set the stage a little bit um, and, and offer the opportunity to any of our panelists who want to take this first question and then we'll sort of start a conversation from there. Um, what is it that makes Europe unique uh, when it comes to innovation? When you think about innovation, um, is there something that immediately comes to mind uh, either present-day, historical, future-oriented? What are the words or ideas you associate first and foremost when you think about Europe and innovation from your perspective? Anyone who wants to start? Early morning. We're looking at you. Okay, well, I will uh, definitely go uh, first as a one of the few European uh, innovators in the software industry, um, we've always found that we had an advantage globally um, by the diversity that you grow up with as a European company. You uh, understand uh, how Europe is a combination of many, many countries with very different cultural backgrounds as well as size and maturity, which gives you actually an opportunity if you know how to deal with it. And so we've seen when we compete against American companies uh, in particular that that DNA of understanding how to leverage diversity uh, alone in our headquarter, uh, we have um, more than 70 different countries uh, uh, from our employees represented and we've been used to that for 39 years. And it gives a tremendous opportunity. It is also a challenge and you need to know how to deal with that. So I would say diversity is the opportunity. The question is, are we today in Europe set up to leverage that diversity or not? So diversity, what else? Um, I would say that when you think of European um, products or things produced, you always think of excellence. So I think the ability to never settle for mediocrity plays into the innovation space uh, very much here in, in Europe. Uh, and what we see is the, the quality of the people, the, the quest with our clients, the quest for producing excellent things really plays into wanting the best and that drives that, that innovation. Do you see that across sectors? Do you think that's a universal truth? Is that universally associated? I, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking about that before I came here and, and I do. I mean, whether we're working with an automobile company or we're working with SAP or we're working with, um, you know, an energy company, it's that, it's that drive mm -hmm. there. And, uh, you don't necessarily see that in, in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so maybe since I'm on my home turf here <laughs> in Vienna, I, and, and you know, seeing this beautiful room here, that uh, Vienna was 100 years ago the center of arts, the center of sciences. This is where blood groups were introduced to the world, where Sigmund Freud developed his ideas, the place of Kafka. Uh, so the real issue is uh, how do we create again an infrastructure, a culture that this can happen again. It doesn't need to be in Vienna, it can be in London, in other places. And <clears throat> having traveled the world and, and you know, being associated with Chinese, uh, the Academy of Sciences there and having lived for a long time in America, I really feel this, this <clears throat> innovation space has shifted to America, is now shifting to India and China, and I think the real future of Europe <clears throat> must be that we create this culture again, this, this culture which basically created these great places in Europe. So, 
So my feeling is that there are a lot of issues we have to address. We have as good ideas as the others, but there are issues of financing, how, how to create good organizations. Do you get the sense, as, as somebody based here, do you get the sense that there is a, a unified view of that richness, of that legacy? Um, is that a pan-European view? Does it, is it heterogeneous across the European Union? Is there, is there such thing as a kind of common European view that you're expressing? I, it, it's coming. I'm a member of the European Research Council, so I'm actually seeing all the best young scientists coming through. So we, we have no lack of really bright people. But in many places, it's this particular interest of, of countries, small spaces, <coughs> small uh, you know, <coughs> local politics, which kind of hinder this diversity, this innovation space. And of course, uh, we have seen that many of our brightest people have left to, to America. <coughs> the, the vice premier of, of Serbia recently told me that 90% of his bright kids are leaving. And so I think it's a, it's a real issue we have to address. We'll pick that up. Reader. Awesome. Um, well, happily, can I pick up on the uh, being an American based in the UK. I do get a sense of both uh, the sides of that discussion, and I think the scale of the American economy, combined with an, uh, a pioneer uh, immigrant uh, culture, has really fostered uh, a, an innovation culture and mindset. Uh, and Europe, being much, you know, each part of it being you know, relatively small, uh, although in total there's a lot of people kind of undermines that to some degree, and, uh, and not being as much of an immigrant culture, they don't have, uh, Europeans don't have that mindset. But one clear advantage, living in the UK and looking at, uh, in particular, the English uh, experience, they, and, and, and most European countries, have historically traveled around the world for good and bad, and, but they have a real understanding of parts of the world, whereas in America we have less uh, international uh, exposure. So I would say one advantage that could very much be leveraged uh, in the European context is collaboration with uh, people all around the world and a leadership uh, uh, role in that area. Great. And that, leave, and that leaves me. Space. Space <laughs> is unique. But what is the strength of space there in terms of innovation? You, if you recall, space enables. So the word, if you're looking for one word that describes space in terms of Innovation, space enables innovation. You look at the way satellite communications have transformed the satellite, uh, the telecommunications industry. We have seen how global positioning satellites have transformed the automotive industry because of uh, navigators. Um, and remote sensing has transformed the way we uh, see the world because Google Earth gives us all the pictures and you can see the front door of somebody and it transformed the way governments must act or, you know, or big companies must act because people can now through Google Earth can see what's, been, what's happening. So if there's one word to describe space, we enable innovation. So at a, time of, at a time of kind of global austerity budgets and cuts, and we've seen cuts certainly in the US and elsewhere for things like space that we would view as, as luxuries, as enablers, as opposed to as immediate job creators or, or sources of economic growth, is your view sitting from a, a UN standpoint that, is it, what, what's the European perspective on this? Is there, is there a, a greater empathy for enabling technologies? Is there a greater likelihood to embark on blue sky CERN, Large Hadron Collider type projects, is it, it, does Europe sit uniquely in the space question? Before I, before I go to Europe, I was at um, the issue of Europe, I was at the telecommunications um, conference a few months ago and everybody there was saying that there was no decrease in the satellite business for telecommunications. <laughs> So even though we have the recession or whatever, um, people still know that tele telecommunication satellites are important. So in some sectors of space, there has not been uh, a drop. But Europe itself, now, if it, and, and Europe of course follows the, the, the trend of the rest of the world. We have this, what we call disruptive technology, equivalent or um, you know, analogous to um, the PCs, and the large um, computers before, because today, universities can build small satellites which they can launch 
into space, and they are, I tell you, quite capable. Um, the only problem there is how to make everybody behave themselves because the access to space is now quite easy and inexpensive. Um, so from the European point of view, I see many universities. Um, Austria is going to launch its university satellite soon. And, um, and there's a lot of uh, sexy technology uh, that's being developed, uh, both in the private sector as well as in the European Space Agency and the different agencies, space agencies. So let's, let's stick with what's working and, and what's enabling, generally speaking, your, your successes across Europe in, in different sectors. What, what should absolutely be preserved? We've talked about a few things here that are seemingly cultural, so the question of diversity, uh, the richness of sitting in a room like this, uh, the pursuit of unequivalent, uh, unequivocal uh, excellence, um, these kinds of themes. What, what very practically from an uh, economic standpoint, from a uh, uh, political standpoint, uh, from a technological or scientific standpoint, what's working for you to sort of enable your successes as innovators in, in Europe? What, what should be preserved at all costs as we sort of will unwrap this towards what's not working and what kind of recommendations do we need to set forth? What absolutely is working? Um, we can start anywhere if anyone wants to tackle that. We're not going to go this way again because then it's go, they'll, be, they'll know what's coming. So I, who wants to start? Reed, do you want to start? Sure. Um, well, I have a particular focus uh, and I see that um, clearly there, I, I see three phases of, of innovation I, uh, based on the scale of an enterprise. So I, I see st a startup uh, challenge as discrete uh, and important, the small and medium business and then the multinational, all of which are doing innovation, uh, but they have very different challenges. So uh, I feel the kind of going in reverse order, the multinationals challenge is that in some ways they have vested interests. You know, they have a, a way of doing things. They've done them for 20, 50, 100 years and to change is, can be painful, it's the disruptive or destructive uh, uh, challenge they face. But then again, if they sit on their hands, as Kodak experienced in New York, they could get left behind. Uh, small and medium enterprises, I think, have huge potential for all countries, but with financial situations, as we've recently seen, getting access to capital, clearly in the UK, is now the, the primary challenge uh, faced by small and medium. Where I focus, and I run a, a, a green product incubator for startups, uh, the challenge is that uh, most investors, venture capitalists, even angel investors are too busy to do due diligence on very, very small ideas. So that's, uh, so they can't, they struggle with getting anyone's attention. And secondly, they need advice. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do, but there's not a lot of it. So we hope to encourage that type of support for startups. So on one side, uh, if we were to look forward, what you're advocating is a kind of greater maturity and evolution of the sort of venture climate. What, what from a startup standpoint, uh, is working? I mean, what are you seeing as, as enablers of successful startups in Europe that's distinct to Europe? To, to, all, to answer your, your original question, um, I think the big opportunity we're now facing, largely driven by the internet, is that uh, we have access to information and there are people around the world that can cross-collaborate, so that's very much working. I don't think we've quite realized what's coming. And secondly, I think that the recognition that the environment is in peril is giving people a real focus. Now, people are obviously inventing and, and innovating in all sorts of areas, so high-tech, um, biotech. But you don't need a PhD to innovate in the green space. It cuts across all sectors. So you can be a farmer, you can be a, uh, a factory floor worker and come up with a really important idea. And that actually opens up the scope. We don't just need you know, college-educated students to be part of this. So I, I, I hope that uh, governments and funders recognize that uh, they should be looking wide and far at a whole range of new things that will be coming. Jamie Arpik. Yeah, I, um, I would just spend a second on defining uh, innovation uh, because I think it's important um, that we have the right concept for innovation. Uh, many people confuse creativity and innovation. Uh, creativity is, um, what should I say, converting money into ideas. And innovation, in my vocabulary, is converting ideas into money. <laughs> and what that means is that it's the combination of the greatness of the idea multiplied by the ability to bring it to market. 
And so what's the strength of Europe, in my opinion? We have a market structure, even a country structure, where the small ideas are there. We've seen many, many disruptive ideas come from Europe. Um, and we should definitely keep that ability. In fact, if you look at countries in Europe where the most, um, let's say, disruptive ideas come from, they're typically even small countries. Um, and so there is that entrepreneurship, that willingness to create ideas. The question is whether we're good or not at, at scale. And if you look at many of the disruptive ideas that were created in Europe, the MP3 file format was created in Europe. The uh, Skype was a European uh, idea. Uh, they all got scaled somewhere else. And, and so to your question, what is it we need to preserve? We need to preserve the entrepreneurship that comes from the diversity and heterogeneous structure that we have in Europe with many, many, many small companies. And then we need to add the ability uh, to scale. It's a little bit like you need to be good at the first 100 meters, but it is a marathon. Um, good, good examples of marathon runners in, in Europe is Germany. Germany is one of those you know, long-term thinking, willingness to invest even in a crisis, and you see uh, Germany coming out of the crisis much faster than most countries in Europe, I think for that reason. Now, the question is, how can we combine these two capabilities? How can we and when we strongly believe at SAP, this idea of fostering co-innovation, where large and small come together, and, and there's large companies, the multinationals help the small come up with the ideas and scale the ideas, and not by taking them over, but by giving them platforms on which they can grow an international business much faster than they could stand alone. And because we don't have that today, they tend to be sold to some big company instead. I think that's wrong and it's, it's not going to be the future. We need the co-innovation of the thousands rather than only the big. So, so you would sort of characterize the shift here as being um, from a climate of immediately integrating, acquiring these individual diverse startups to kind of co-creating them, co-evolving them, yeah. that being a catalyst for scale. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, a trend of, of a change in trend where the old mindset was one of centralization. You know, if you're centralized, you can scale. Um, and, and if you look at the issues we have in Europe on the diversity and, and creating a European something, it's very hard to do with a centralistic approach. But maybe there is that next generation of thinking where it's a platform and openness where you invite participation of the many rather than central, centralization. You might achieve the combination of scale and idea much faster and better than buying centralizing everything. What's the, Joseph, what's the, what's, if you sort of take that and the analog from a, from a research standpoint and fostering a, a, a unified research ecosystem, unified IP system, unified talent uh, mobility, these kinds of in, in enablers of one part of the innovation chain, um, is this pursuit on the uh, commercialization side of, of perhaps um, evolving to sort of slightly a, a more decentralized approach? Um, a, a lot of research in Europe has been moving seemingly in the opposite direction. Is, do, you, do you pick up on that? Do you sense that? Do you, how do you respond to that from a research uh, standpoint? Yeah, I, I, I worked for a long time in North America and, and now I'm back since seven years in Europe. And actually, when I decided to come back, my American friends always told me I, I must be completely out of my mind to go back to the European Union. But I, I had this sense, you know, this is actually the place you want to be. You know, Central Europe, it's this forgotten reg region, but there are 170 million people, you know, well-educated, they're clever, uh, they're hungry, you know, they want to do something. So I actually think this is one of the most interesting places to be. <clears throat> and then I had this very weird idea to build the FC Barcelona of, of life sciences. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I cannot name a Viennese team, which I would like to do, but so, <clears throat> and, and so I, I, we started from zero, basically. <clears throat> so the, the question was really how to create the space in, in an environment where all my American friends tell me you should not go into. Uh, how do you create a space which attracts the best talent? Because without getting the right people, you know, we can't talk a, a nice talk and we get nowhere. And, and literally after seven years creating a playground, a candy store, 
for you know, uh, intellectual and infrastructure candy store where we hire the most brilliant people on the planet around it. So we, we, you know, we don't have to hide from anybody anymore. I think we can compete against anybody. We do play in the Champions League. So, so lots of things have changed. Also, when I came, the European Union uh, distributed funds by this huge network grants. A friend of mine, actually, who came from the old Soviet Union, uh, told me once the European Union became the new Soviet Union. You know, uh, you get only your grants if you have somebody from certain countries and, and certain companies. <clears throat> but also, that's changing with the introduction of the European Research Council. So I have a real feeling <clears throat> Europe is moving in the right direction. And from my own experience, what happened now, we have now basically 200 people uh, working in our place. We have 200 applicants for a single position, and the Americans are now coming. So, <clears throat> so this brain drain we have been all talking about and have been exposed, and I was one of the people who were drained from this country. When I moved to America, I, I have a strong feeling it's actually being coming back to Europe. Uh, what we still lack is, is an environment where we can push our ideas into in innovation, into money. And I think this is what, the, what we can really learn from the Americans and, and from the Chinese. Let's, let's pick up on this. One of the ideas that, that um, you know, is very much uh, fundamental to, to your institute has been taking lots of little risks and, and really being very pro-risk. Um, and I know that you've had a hand in, in setting up funding apparatuses within Europe to sort of fund higher risk research. Is there, do, do you get the sense that that's well received across the European community uh, in terms of funding higher risk research um, that may or may not have more immediate economic impact instead of funding uh, alternative energy but funding things that uh, are not even at the level of enablers where there's sort of a nice label for it. Basic, real, high-risk kind of research. Is, is there an uh, attitude around that that you're sensing? Is it changing? Is it unique in any way? Uh, uh, is it working, not working? It, it's unfortunately not, not changing in the way I would like to see it. Uh, and the reason is, you know, with all this, and the lift for this, all this, the research councils and we invest in biotech and nanotech and everybody had these big buzzwords. But when you really look what worked in the United States, uh, the companies didn't uh, develop in Delaware because you saved taxes. They developed around centers of excellence, uh, centers of innovation in San Francisco and Boston. So I think what Europe really needs to understand is to, to push basic research, to push risky projects and then create an environment which enables that uh, <clears throat> this risky project is actually being put into real companies. And also one reality for us is, because having started two biotech companies, <clears throat> you know, uh, <clears throat> when we ask for money, if I get 500,000 euros, I'm already happy. My old friends in the US, you know, when they start a company, they get 50 million dollars. <laughs> and <clears throat> our ideas are as good as theirs, but you can bet twice who will win the game in the long term. Um, Doreen, uh, design helps companies take measured risks and, and mediate that risk, um, become more uh, uh, conversant with risk. Are you getting the sense that, that the equivalent question about uh, design culture within companies, is that changing, is that unique, is that working within your European clients? Um, the pursuit of excellence has, has long been an attribute, as you noted, of, of Europe. Um, how is that factoring into sort of design culture, design practices within companies? Yeah, I mean, I think what, what's great about the word design now, I, I mean, you know, design could be used in a boardroom where it was something five years ago you would have never done. It's yeah. something that now people understand the value of design. Um, I also wanted to answer your previous question. Yeah. Um, I think there's been an interesting confluence of a lot of different things in the last two to three years that have really changed the landscape. When you look at the, the world right now, um, you had obviously this recession that came into play, but you also had incredibly disruptive technologies that came in that we never expected would hit the way they hit. So you have businesses and, and people scrambling to figure out um, 
how to structure their, their, even their product life cycles. Products the life cycles used to be 18 months, two years, three years. I mean, when I started in this business, they were you know two years, you, every two two and a half years. You know, Intel used to have a roadmap that was long. They're three months now. P businesses can't even keep up with the demand out there. And this is being driven by the public. And because of all these changes that's gone on where the public now is demanding, right? The end user demands, and you probably get this with your business all the time. They demand what they want. They tell you what you want. And people almost can't keep up with it fast enough. So there's a big adjustment that has to go on around funding, around doing the research. There's how, how do you get these products into the market that are right? I, what I see a lot of, uh, particularly because we work a lot with um, investors is there's almost a fear factor too on their side because they don't know what to go after because things are moving so fast. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting time that honestly said I haven't seen. How does the, how does a three month, you know, a life cycle and rapid iteration and, and releasing things in beta, this kind of culture of, of now rapid innovation, I mean, how does that sit alongside, you know, this that we, that you characterized earlier on as, as distinctly European? you know, this, this can't be rapid iterated, you can't rapid prototype, this is what we associate with being European. How does that resonate with your European clients? Well, I think there's a, there's a big difference between software development and producing a building, right? So obviously you still have to create a, a, a building the way you've always done, but I think in software, everyone's accepted that there's actually a stickiness to having a beta product out there and, and being able to go back to your client. You know, we've had several, you know, Apple being, of course, one of them, uh, companies that have taught us that it's okay to put products that are not, that are very, very good, but you accept that updates will come, that it will get better, and that's part of the relationship that you begin to have. It's a very, very, di it's very different than when it was two years ago. Um, sure. yeah. yeah, I wanted to comment on that because I, uh I see that exactly the same thing, that this speed of innovation, particularly when it's um, um, as easy to distribute as software, um, what that does, it comes back to my point earlier, that we've had phases of centralization to be powerful. What we are doing right now as a company, even though we are one of the big players, is that we are empowering teams of 10 to work directly with the customer and figure it out. Don't ask headquarter, you know, because it takes too long. And that means that you have this decentralization, this extreme empowerment of people um, that have creative ideas. The only thing I demand is that they stay loyal to a strategy. So you have to be articulate on your strategy. I strongly believe you need a platform so you don't get chaos. You need something to build on that's consistent. But then you have to let loose. You have to kind of unleash the innovation um, of your employees by empowering them decentrally and by inviting a whole ecosystem. We have more than two million people in our SAP developers network, and we have only 14,000 developers at SAP. Can you imagine the power of inspiring two million people or 10 million people? Uh, just look at what happened with Apple and their way of opening up an ecosystem approach. So extreme decentralization based on platforms, and the question I have is, could that be an idea for Europe? that we think of Europe not as trying to you know, make common rules for everything, but we try and make platforms. What about a healthcare platform? What about a research platform? Where the internet was a platform that articulated um, a certain protocol for how things can be decentralized and still connect, what if we could do that for some of the major challenges we have in Europe? And with that, you get the power of being Europe and you get the power of decentralization, which is the trend because of the innovation speed. Let, let's pick up on that idea of platforms. I think that's an interesting one. So, so from a, um, a public sector standpoint um, and from a social entrepreneurship standpoint, so other, other buttresses to that kind of platform, um, how, has, uh, how have you seen the changes in terms of uh, public sector, private sector collaboration? Are you seeing that within a space context? Is there more initiatives to share risk create government-funded platforms and basic research that startups can live off of? What's, what's your sense? And, and also from a social entrepreneurship standpoint, are there sort of the large-scale kind of platform social issues that, that we're getting the sense Europe is tackling commonly that are maybe instigators of these kinds of platforms Jim's talking about? Well, I can start with uh, space. Um, for more than 10 years now, the private sector investment in space has exceeded the uh, investment by governments. 
um, this is good in, in many ways, but um, our, so here I'd like to pick up an issue which you, you brought up in the beginning, which is um, what should be preserved uh, in terms of setting up all these platforms and enabling uh, innovation, is that our governance, uh, the, the instruments for governance does not, cannot uh, catch up with the fact that private sector uh, is investing more in space now. Because if you look at the outer space treaties, um, and they're all the United Nations treaties and uh, conventions, which forms the body for international space regime, they do not recognize the private sector. And there's a lot of um, ways now by which we'll have to include the private sector in, in, in launching um, and everything else. But I think the important thing that we need to look at in Europe, for instance, we now have the European Code of Conduct in space, and that's very innovative because um, it, it's a way of making sure all the European uh, countries behave in, in, a, in a manner that will preserve um, space to enable everyone to be creative or uh, innovative and to support the private sector entry into space. Um, I, I see it that way. What about from a social entrepreneurship standpoint? Um, well, I think it's a uh, very interesting idea. I would maybe start less from the tech side, not coming from that uh, field. But I think that there are some cultural platforms, actually, that could be uh, could bring everyone together on common principles and then but equally have the diversity that is in Europe. And one, just as a, I think a good example, that uh, is around sort of sustainable food. And so in, uh, and it manifests in different ways, but I think everyone is recognizing we need to, if there's big droughts or big energy shortages, how do we feed ourselves and how does the world feed itself? Uh, in Italy, it has a slow food movement, which is quite profound. It's actually the, the opposite of rapid prototyping, but you know, how do we actually go back to some basics, and I think there's some important uh, thinking there. Uh, in the UK, the organic food movement, uh, equally powerful, um, albeit controversial globally. Uh, so I, 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 I agree that finding some common philosophical grounding and technical grounding could be very useful. Uh, one thing you noted there, and, and let's use that as a launch pad into one more issue and then take your questions as well. Um, uh, you know, so we talk about food, and clearly there are moments where we've seen uh, uh, cultural resistance, we've seen a variety of resistance to sort of innovation when it came to food, when it's come to food in Europe. Um, two aspects here. One is clearly there's not been a, a homogeneous reaction across Europe to innovations in those kinds of sectors. It's been heterogeneous across different countries. There's not been a common European response to GMO or a common European response to many things. Does there need to be a common European view? Uh, is, that, is, that, is that even a, a reasonable premise to strive for, or is that kind of inconceivable? Um, but without it, uh, you know, can you foster these kinds of social platforms if, if there isn't a kind of common view on things like food or GMO across Europe? Uh, I think that there would be, I, I think Europe in, in facing the challenges that we're facing has to come together on some big principles. And I mean, certainly in the US you know, with 300 million people, when they decide to go to the moon, they get there. And I, don't, it, I think it would be hard for small countries in Europe to do so, but they can, Europe really not afford to come up with a common energy strategy, particularly with a partnership with North Africa to get solar. I mean, why that isn't being done, you know, with it. Maybe that because it's, there's no central leader to kind of set that proverbial North Star goal of which we could all you know, be driving towards is, is hindering us. Maybe it just needs to be some louder leadership saying let's, we have everything to gain by collaboration here. Let's create a platform. Let's work together. You'd welcome that as an entrepreneur? Uh, well, you always, as an entrepreneur, are looking at how to find your own way through that. But I think on some of these big issues, uh, I think that kind of collaboration would be uh, profound. Uh, well, just to just to pick up on this question, so you know, the in this country, the second worst word in the public is actually genetics. So, being a geneticist, I always found this interesting to be actually you know on the on the dark side of society. <laughs> So I think we can bring a lot to the table and it's probably the century of genetics and genetics will provide lots of solutions to 
food safety, food security, growing plants somewhere. But it, it's in, you know, that's how the politicians believe they can score on these issues. Uh, so it, it's, it's very tricky and it's what I find a little uh, disheartening in, the, in this Europe, that this, this little units with the little local governments who, who try to play to the clientele <clears throat> and actually like this idea of platforms because this is where really the European Union could come in. Uh, play great platforms, have great visions. One reason why space exploration is so successful is because you know, there's this singular idea to build a space station which where many countries get together and make a single push. The same for CERN. <clears throat> the physics people somehow manage to lobby the European Union and Americans to build this big accelerator to do the research. And I think there are some unique opportunities, you know, to just make a push against cancer, <clears throat> you know, just yeah. tell all of us and have a general push from industry, from governments, from the European Union to move in this direction, pull resources, pull brains, and really, you know, create this space exploration for certain parts of life sciences. I think this is a great idea. Yeah, we have a, a unique opportunity now because we suddenly have connection to everyone. Huh? There's like six, million, uh, six billion mobile phones out there connected somehow. Uh, so, so we are on individual level connecting people. And this is an opportunity we've never had before. No? And, and so I tr truly believe that the idea generation must be a decentral thing. The question is, can we facilitate that so that we don't invent the same things? I, I'm from Denmark, okay? I don't know if you know, but recently Denmark launched a rocket. So Denmark is becoming a space <laughs> country. And this little rocket was built by an entrepreneurial team of private people who have this great vision, okay? Mm, what should I say? Uh, I believe that if we had shared in Europe, maybe we'd, we could, could have gotten further out and had a bigger impact uh, instead of trying to rebuild what's already known. Why don't we build on, on what's already known and, 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 and advance? And if we don't solve that in Europe, I am deeply concerned because growth is happening somewhere else right now. It's not in Europe. And um, while we have great people, I'm not sure we have enough focus on education and research in Europe. Um, and um, I am also concerned with the complexity. We're trying to solve this problem. How do we get common rules through um, you know, rules and regulation and committees? And uh, I think it's a well-known fact that the camel was uh, a horse created by a committee. No? And, and, and so committees is not necessarily the best way to progress things. Could we find other ways to get that decentral innovation power focused and leveraged? Also because innovation by its nature, if you think about it, and you talk, you talk about disruption, it's, it's always about breaking the rules. So here we are, we'll set up the structures, which are needed because we need the funding, and we do need the research, and we do need to educate our people. But at the end of the day, you've got to, let, you've got to give people the opportunity to break the rules too. Mm. Because that's what that's what done it, and that's why you have these, you know, these people that go off in their in their corners and go and do their thing because they don't want to be burdened by again all of the top-down uh, rules that come at them, right? So they just go through the back door and they do things. So you have this interesting dichotomy that happens that you have to allow, and I think that's what you talked about, uh, particularly in in the Silicon Valley or in Boston, is you have somehow that balance has come into play, right? Where you've got funding that will fund this, um, and, but you know that you're, what you're looking for are, are people that break those rules too. It seems like this tension between um, collaboration and, and pursuing national competitiveness remains uh, despite pursuit of, of common principles, common currency, common governance structures, um, almost a reluctance to give up some national competitiveness despite it. It almost seems like this is a, an opportunity for Europe to show the world how to do this. It's something that, frankly, the world has to figure out now is common goals, common innovation, innovation for global good, and it seems like something Europe could help us all see. Let's take some of your questions, and then we'll, we'll go back to uh, a few more here. Yeah. Do we have a red-jacketed person? Thank you. I'm 
a little bit concerned with the panel. I mean, firstly, I would say, are we all sitting there saying we're comfortable with the way innovation is happening in Europe? For me, I, I'm very uncomfortable. Uh, so I'd like the panel to talk about the conditions for creating an environment for innovation. We heard yesterday the Ru Russian Federation deciding to create the second Silicon Valley. Why didn't Europe create the second Silicon Valley? I'm beset by corporate fear. I read the other day that over 60% of European countries ban the use of Facebook and Twitter in the workplace. That's nonsense. So there's corporate fear, I think, playing here. And secondly, it took us half of the conversation before the word risk was mentioned. So I'd argue, have we got an appetite in Europe for risk, or are we just too comfortable? One of the speakers talked about breaking the rules. We don't break the rules in Europe. We love rules. We behave by rules, and we punish people who break rules. I guess these are why these are the game changers. Um, anyone want to tackle that? Yeah, I have a very big passion for your question because I, um, uh, I totally agree with you. I actually think we have a pretty um, challenging situation in Europe. So, I, so, so far the questions were around what are the good things about Europe and I find good things in Europe. But in a global economy, I'm concerned. I'm concerned because we, have, we don't have our act together yet. I'm concerned because we don't uh, have uh, the same appetite as I see in other countries. We have uh, 6,000 people in India. I mean, these people get up in the morning and they have one thing in their mind. It is becoming better than anyone else in this world and they work long hours, they educate themselves to the extreme and they are extremely innovative. We have this sometimes perception in Europe that you know, you do the smart things in Europe and you outsource the dummy tasks to some low-cost location. If you are in India and China for the price, you're making a big mistake. You're there for the talent because there's lots of great talent. So in that global economy, I am actually concerned, as concerned as you. What I'm saying is that there are some benefits in Europe. There are some cultural, historic things that we dealt with in the past, which could be of an opportunity. But we are not tackling that today in a consistent enough way. And if we go down the path of continuously doing what we do today, we will not compete in the future. And so I'm here also to say, wake up Europe. There are opportunities in Europe, but we need to change the way we do things. I don't think more rules will help. I think platforms might help. Uh, we lost the whole consumer world to the Americans. Um, and we are losing the next battles in many new innovative industries as well to the Chinese and the Indians. So I'm, I'm absolutely where you are. I'm suggesting a different approach in Europe, that we don't look for the rules and regulations. So we sit in long meetings and take years and years to come up with something that's anyway uh, the, the least common denominator and therefore has no impact but that we foster platform thinking and we identify the five or eight platforms that we want to drive uh, global leadership on innovation on and then we start getting our act together. We invest, we inspire people. And I haven't even talked about the demographic problem that we have. If you take the aging population uh, alone, I mean these young people who come out of school these days, my kids need to be um, genius. You know, they need to work for three people. Uh, to make this equation work if we all live 10 years longer. And the, the inefficiency in healthcare is unbelievable. We cannot continue like that with an aging population. So I'm where you are. I'm not giving up though. I'm a European headquartered company with lots of success and innovation. And I'm saying let's tackle this problem in a different way because individually is not enough. Then everyone will do a small rocket and it won't get us to the moon. Another question. Yeah. My name is Wagner, Innovation Institute. Uh, regarding the idea of platforms, I'm optimistic for Scandinavian countries, but I'm fully pessimistic for the rest of Europe based on 20 years of experience on the ground. And I give an example. The Romanians set up an electronic procurement platform already 10 years ago. None of the neighboring countries did adopt it because they dislike Romania. The same happened with the PPP platform of Hungary. Excellent, but none of the neighboring countries wanted to adopt it because 
was they dislike Hungary. And just to end up with an example, a domestic example from Austria, the city of, of Vienna set up a free e-government service and the government of Upper Austria, 150 kilometers far away, was not ready to take a free uh, example of e-government service. Why? Because the city of government is run by socialists and the city of Lower uh, Upper Austria is run by conservatives. So these are the mental barriers in Europe. It's not a lack of informa information or communication. The European Union already abandoned seven years ago to fund platforms. We have plenty of platforms in Europe. It's a mental problem, it's a historical problem. Uh, Europe is completely divided between the nations and unless this is not solved, I believe the platform idea will not succeed, at least not in the south of Europe. So you want to comment here? Yeah. Uh, maybe, so <clears throat> maybe I can bring a counter argument. I actually believe sciences would be a, a great opportunity for the European Union to integrate people <clears throat> because we are completely international, we speak one language, we have this one common goal to figure out how things work and I actually strongly believe if there's a strong push to use the sciences like the euro to integrate the countries, I think there's a, is enormous opportunity. So I actually would, I, I I'm, you know, I'm in the same space, I can completely confirm what you're tell, saying here, but I think we, we should not just give up on this. I think there's a huge opportunity, and especially the sciences should be taught in this place, should be, should be the, the next project, in my opinion, the next vision, in my opinion, for the European Union. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, what made this country rich? It was innovation, it was good scientists driving you know, <clears throat> take risks, uh, finding new things. Uh, and I think this is exactly what we need for European Union. And of course, to, to combine this with, with, you know, with scientists live to, in our little holes, uh, <clears throat> no, we don't, we're not happy if people tell us what we should do. So it's a fine line between creating the Bell Laboratories of Europe to create the space for freedom for, for people who take, think outside of the box, who take complete risks, uh, do things uh, where everybody tells you it cannot work, it will not work, and five years later you show them that, that it can work. So I, I think there's an opportunity we should not miss, and I think it should be a real project for the European Union. I, I also think things happen out of necessity sometimes. You know, hmm. you're, you're forced into doing things that you never thought would have happened. And when you talk about what's going on in India and China and Africa, I mean, innovation happens there also often out of necessity um, because you know you they don't have the things that we have here in Europe or or in other parts of the world and so what's happening now what I see what's happening in Europe it's it, and it's a glimmer of light is because of what happened in this recession because of how bad things got people had to look at things differently and the question is how much are they going to push it you know how much is someone going to push and just say I'm not going to accept the status quo and that's what it takes you know, it, it does, it is that rule breaker that's going to get through some of the systems and say, look at this, look at what we can accomplish here. And maybe it's a small group of, of com countries, it's not everyone, and people then gather on. But that's usually what it takes to make that, that type of change. So there, there's a culture in Europe that, that resists this kind of thing that we're hearing about in these sort of two somewhat pessimistic questions. Um, uh, is Europe prepared to give up, to sacrifice? some of the things that give it its comfort and its culture in order to be able to catalyze this kind of risk taking and frankly this kind of investment because you take it out of somewhere in order to you know advance this kind of risk taking is there something that's is it intractable is it a question of resource reallocation is it a fundamental cultural shift and, and is that even possible and something desirable i always i always look at this question because that question comes and you think if you don't do it what's going to happen somebody else with India and China will get better at it for example right Africa if, if you don't do it you'll be relegated to being in a, in a second or third or fourth place and so the question is is that desire there to get and and I don't believe in in revolution as much as the evolution in terms of innovation right I don't think I think you start that incrementally with a smaller group, with people that can show, maybe it is in the sciences, that can show that there, there is that change that can happen. Because it will happen, it always does, and the question is, 
are, you know, will they, I don't think Europe is going to be left out in the cold. I think you're going to have a group that's going to begin to form a force here. But, but we need work on three levels, in my opinion. First of all, as a big company, I think we should take much more responsibility. I understand the political issues. And so companies that have the means should take much more response. Don't sit back and wait for politicians to solve these problems. You know, we are launching the idea of a business web. We are opening up for many other global companies to be part of this and try and create that platform for connectivity between companies. And if we, if we sit and wait for it to be decided, it will never happen. So do it. Just do it. And I think that commitment from companies to put more money on innovation even in tough times is a very important one. And in particular, the large companies to be opening up and teaming up and getting things done. Once you've done that, you can go to the national levels and say, hey, are we good enough in education? I don't think so in Europe. Why don't we leverage the fact that we can offer in Europe one year in Rome, one year in London, one year in Paris, one year in Moscow, one year in Prague as an education? We're not leveraging that. And so that's a national challenge that needs to be resolved to say, how do we modularize our education system so Europe becomes the place you want to educate yourself? And that attracts talent, and that is the foundation for innovation. No? Um, and, and, and you need, of course, the national support for innovation, for R&D, etc. And then comes the European, but it has come probably in that order, where I would argue, why don't we launch five platforms for Europe? Maybe it's in R&D, maybe it's in healthcare, well, I don't know. Where we foster focused collaboration across countries, because in that world, there are no countries. The internet knows no boundaries. Did you want to? Well, I, I wanted to pick up on what Doreen had, uh, said about uh, necessity uh, being the mother of invention. Uh, and I think two th big things that have happened recently actually are an opportunity that have yet to be fully realized. And one is that the economic crisis, I think, gave a big wake-up call to everyone that the economy is moving east and actually we've got to get out of our chairs. We can't just, <coughs> things aren't going to be the same. But the second is, I think, the recognition that's, uh, of scarcity, of resources that are, you know, oil is an obvious one, but there's plenty of others. And I think that the, that, that fear that we may run out of things is percolating in the minds of, of millions of people around the world, but Europeans equally. And I think there is, a, and, and it's a real necessity. You know, if we can't eat, if we can't travel, if we don't have things that we would like, uh, I think that that can catalyze a lot of opportunity. So I'd, I actually think that, that uh, there may be room for historical sluggishness vis-a-vis -vis the American experience, but I think Europe may have as good a chance at pioneering a, a new green innovation revolution as anyone. Let's take, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment rather than answer, you know, provide a solution. I think I might be the only non-European in this room. I can't see the audience. But, I, you know, as a non-European, I see Europe as extremely exciting because of the diversity. And I love the idea where you say, you know, why don't we have education one year in, in Moscow and one year in London? Because if you study what, um, how the Nobel laureates um, invent or innovate, Every time they encounter a new or somewhere where they're not in their com comfort zone, as when I have to come from Malaysia to a German-speaking country and if I have to then speak Russian, I think that um, triggers a lot of um, new excitement. And that's where I think Europe is exciting. So I, I can see the pessimism, but I think Europe is very exciting Thank from you. the non-European view. <laughs> Let's take another couple of questions. My, no, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, my name is Jan Anderson from Nordic Innovation. And uh, just a few observations here, because last week I was at a similar conference in the, in the US, and it's very interesting to, to listen to the debate in Europe, because it seems to me that we always have kind of, when we discuss innovation, it's always in the context of science and research together. And it seems that we got mixed ourselves up in the sense that, if we look at it, I very much agree with what was uh, said from uh, Mr. Snabe that what innovation is, and innovation is not the same as uh, research. 
by definition, most innovation is focused and it's mostly focused on solving a specific problem, whereas research at the heart is about being open-ended and discovery and invention. So that's one thing. I think we got ourselves mixed up in Europe when we discussed innovation. Number two is that we very much focus on the, the framework conditions, business framework conditions, which is fine, but I'm not so sure that it's a, a precondition for being competitive and innovative. Take the example, you have two companies with the same framework conditions. How do we explain that company A is performing better than company B within the same sector? I think we should ask ourselves that question when we discuss innovation, especially from the European Commission and uh, these uh, framework programs. Now, thirdly, when Europe had success stories, there are not many in the last 10, 15 years, but it was uh, when we came up with a common standard or platform GSM. So that's absolutely necessary to do that again. And I think the World Wide Web, this was an initiative by companies going together and facilitated this. So I think there can be no discussion, but if we don't get focused in Europe on, as uh, was said earlier, but my question is to the panel, what is it, why is it that we, uh, and what do you think about this uh, research versus innovation? Maybe we should separate these two issues and discuss them uh, in separate rooms to get a clear perspective in the future. Anybody want to separate research from innovation? Um, well, as, um, I, so first of all, I, I, I defined innovation the same way as you did. So I do believe that uh, at the end of the day, we need to convert ideas into money. It's not that I'm you know, money greedy. It is that without the monetization of something, you don't get any impact. Nobody's interested. And so you have to get an impact. Otherwise, it's just a great idea. Um, we have been successful in SAP in working with research. Uh, and, and so I think there is an opportunity to bring research, which is, as you said, you, you are more free. And if you're not that free, it, it will probably never happen. But my opinion is that the brown, groundbreaking ideas happen when you think more freely. And I think there is a world where you can separate the two concerns but connect them so that the, the right ideas, the breakthroughs, get monetized much faster. We have one example at SAP where research with the Hassel Plattner Institute in, in Berlin caused a breakthrough in how you store data in computers and you can now analyze data um, 10,000 times faster than you could before. Um, now why is that important? Because the access to information, the amount of information in this world will double every 18 months. And so there will be too much information and, and so far with the help of Google, we've only learned to find the hay in the haystack. <laughs> uh, but the haystack is growing and we need to be better in finding the needle. And, and so suddenly you need new technologies. And this was a breakthrough because we went with research. And then at a certain stage said, we will commoditize, we will monetize this, build the right products in record time, by the way, very decentral, very close with customers, and then bring it to market. So you're right, it's two different concerns, but we need to couple them when the opportunity is there. Otherwise, research will happen, a, a great idea will be invented, and nobody will take advantage. I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we, that was a world uh, past. I mean, we all heard the stories of Xerox mm -hmm. Park and all this interesting uh, you know, research that lived there until someone turned it into a product. I think because, as you know, I said before, the, the, the life cycles are changing and moving so quickly, the idea to link those two together becomes even more important. The idea to take, te particularly in technology that's moving so quickly, right, when we're trying to look for innovative ideas to solve uh, the fuel problem, you know, to take those research ideas and, and you know, maybe researchers by their nature are not product developers, but to link them up with people who know how to do that, I think becomes really, really important in, in the world. And we'll move this quicker and will help us get to that, that next level. Uh, so since I'm a researcher, so I, I hope I'm innovative sometimes. And, and I actually believe research actually provides solutions to problems. The real issue is, and I think how the word innovation is used here, is to, to take this solved problem or whatever we have done with it take it the next step and make money out of it. So from my own history, we once made this mutant mouse which didn't have any teeth, which turned out to be the master gene for bone loss. 
uh, and now the estimates are this will make three to four billion revenue to a company in, in the United States. Yeah. For example. <laughs> That's the issue. Um, any other questions? Any other? So let me ask one more here and then we can start to wrap up. Um, so we've left sort of the, the talent question and the education question out of the, uh, out of the discussion so far. And, Certainly one of the newer recognitions in the United States now is that uh, the state of preparing kind of the next generation for these kinds of uh, challenges and culture um, has been inadequate, grossly inadequate in fact. Uh, even the way uh, it's measured around the world and, and what it means to foster uh, the kinds of skill sets, whether they are scientific and technical and engineering and math or bringing art and design into it. Um, I, I'm going to be speaking with the Congress in the U.S. in the next couple of weeks about bringing art and design into science education. What's the, what's the view from, uh, from your standpoint in Europe about uh, preparing um, either your next workforce, uh, your uh, undergrads, that your, your postdocs, uh, the people who may want to dream about space in the future? Um, what's your view, what's your sense of responsibility around these issues and, and uh, do you have some recommendations in terms of what Europe needs to do to, to think about preparedness? I'll take that up first. Um, if you're thinking about um, preparing the next uh, generation of uh, the human resource of the people, of course then you go back to education and how you teach them to be critical, thinking critically and all that. But I'd like to go back to this uh, issue that I brought up, that um, in order to preserve, um, in order to be able to continue to innovate using our space assets, in order to make sure the future generations can still access that space, we think it's huge, but it is very fast getting congested. So I would like to go back to the issue of um, in order to preserve for the, uh, things for the future generation, we have to have those um, rules and regulations. I know that whenever I talk to the university students when they are you know, building this innovative satellite, the last thing they want to hear about is um, rules and regulations. But I tell them that rules and regulations are there to protect the innovation. It's not there to inhibit the, the innovation. Because you, you could have the most fantastic, um, you know, technology breaking satellite in the world. If you, let, if you send it up to space and you don't follow the rules, you're going to be shut down. And so um, I feel that, that that kind of issue is not sometimes properly brought up in the, within the innovation uh, circle in the space uh, arena at least. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on, on talent? Okay. Yeah. No. Let's go ahead. Uh, well, I come back just again to use a US-Europe uh, analogy. Uh, growing up, we were continually to told as young people that, you know, that we, that anyone could be president. And it's really is a truism that there is opportunity if you apply yourself. And uh, in the European context, you know, certainly with young people that we come across, uh, you know, trying to ensure that they feel that, that, their, uh, that their efforts can be uh, viable is the critical point, if they feel that there's a chance and they apply themselves. And so, I, but I think kind of having an emblem of that is, is, would very much help, having the Bill Gates of the, net, you know, in, in our space, it's green innovation. If we can get one big success story, uh, then 10,000 more may follow. So to my mind, Championing and finding those uh, next generation of innovators and, and getting them profile is important. Uh, so, so recently, I listened to some radio program talking about Gustav Mahler, and to my surprise, Gustav Mahler in his high school had to learn natural sciences. It was actually a topic called sciences. Uh, we have no topic in the school which is called sciences. So, so actually, I think what would be absolutely essential not just for this country, but for many European countries to introduce this topic to schools. Uh, you know, we have to learn, my kids have to learn Latin and, and things like this, <clears throat> but they learn maybe 10 hours in the entire school life about DNA. So, which of course will be 
you know, <clears throat> drive economies in the future. <clears throat> so, so first thing I believe there must be a strong push for public education starting from seven year olds and to teach them. Uh, <clears throat> one thing we have been doing in our place, we created the lab space for kids. So we had more than 13,000 kids already in our institute, you know, they learn about uh, flies and worms and other things. And it's not to indoctrinate them, it's to, to tell them, you know, it's the, to be a scientist is the coolest thing you, you can be in the world. Uh, you know, you can solve problems, you get up in the morning, you don't know what's happening in the evening, you might get rich one day. It's actually a decent job and, and this is exactly what we want to show them. And, and I think the third one is <coughs> sciences, as, as you know, and you did amazingly and do amazingly in the US and somewhere else. Sciences is not just to <coughs> solve problems, because that's what we learn. It's about learning how to ask this question, why? And I think a society where people are critical, don't believe everything they're told <coughs> is, is, I mean, that's the society we have to strive for. So, so sciences, in my opinion, is, is very political and, and it's, it's a very important issue to deal with. Um, I, I think education is the big, one of the biggest blockers we have now because, um, because of across the board, just, you know, uh, no matter what country you're in, cuts in education that have gone on, um, we've taken the curiosity out of education. So we allow children to have, you know, good basic education and we've taken the absolute curiosity. And if you don't have parents that are pushing it, you get a lot of children that are, are coming out, you know, vanilla and don't understand how to ask questions or have a fear factor about challenging the rules. Uh, and and that's, that's a fundamental problem. It starts there. I know when, you know, I, I hire a lot of uh, curious uh, people and uh, it's very, very difficult. And it's particularly difficult in Europe here for, for us to hire. We have a, a severe hiring shortage here for us. And the type of people that we look for who are very talented but innately curious and problem solvers, hard to come by. Yeah, I must say I'm, I'm concerned for Europe on education. I, for me, everything starts with education. <laughs> My, that, that's how you, you're successful long term. It is having the smartest people. Um, and in a world where many of the tasks are being automated, that is the only thing left that differentiates you. Um, uh, I think we are in Europe, um, the average is not good enough and the elite is not good enough. Uh, and we are not paying enough attention to this problem and if we don't do that soon, this will cost us dearly in a generation where uh, we need it the most. Um, yeah, I look at India, uh, I visited m many times of course, IIT in India, uh, engineering uh, school. Uh, Quality-wise, they see themselves as MIT, just IIT uh, in India. Um, India produces 250,000 uh, top engineers today. I estimate that number will go beyond 1 million. Now, I come from a country with 5 million people. It gives you a perspective. You know? There's uh, 520 million people in India below 25 years. Uh, you start understanding what education is going to mean to the next generations and our ability in Europe. Uh, I feel we need to take much more aggressive and focused effort around education and start leveraging the diversity, which was your first question. What is great about Europe? It is our culture of diversity. So why don't we have classrooms with international people why don't we have classrooms that cross the boundaries of educational areas? Because it is in the boundaries between areas that new things happen. I don't think energy will be solved without having automotive in the room, the utility in the room, and software in the room. So where's that classroom where that's happening? And by the way, without the design thinking method methodology where you design for sustainability, end-to-end -end life cycle, um, cradle to cradle, we're going to be out of resources anyway. And, and, and those are educational opportunities we're totally missing today and we must do something about that and we can in Europe and it's time we do that. I think that's a good point to leave on. Um, I think you've heard uh, a, a really wonderful set of ideas about uh, what is unique to Europe and what needs to be preserved and also a recognition of what some of the challenges are. But I've, I think you've heard uh, despite 
challenges to the, uh, to the status quo uh, and to the state of Europe, there's a great deal of optimism here uh, from these disruptors, these game changers. Thanks very much.